Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gordon LaForge. I am a senior policy analyst with the Planetary Politics Initiative here at New America. Uh, as that video just suggested, our next discussion is going to focus on global digital governance. Uh, this is a subject that we think in, uh, about a lot here at New America in planetary politics, and we've been working on a lot. Um, as Paul mentioned in his opening remarks, we've just published a report entitled uh, Governing the Digital Future that's on our website. I encourage you all to check it out. This panel is titled A Just and Equitable Digital Future. And to introduce our panelists and steer us through this conversation, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Candice Rondo. Candice is the senior director of both planetary politics and the Future Frontlines program here at New America. She's also a professor of practice with the Center on the Future of War at Arizona State University. And she is a leading expert on the Wagner Group. Candace is an award winning, for which she's been getting a lot of attention recently. <laughs> you may have seen her on TV. Uh, Candace is an award winning investigative journalist. And previously, before coming to New America, she held positions at the International Crisis Group the U.S. Institute for Peace, and she was Washington Post bureau chief in Kabul, Afghanistan for a stint. She is and always has been a very sharp observer of how digital technologies shape conflict, sovereignty, and human rights. So with that, I will turn it over to Candace. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gordon, for uh, that very warm and kind of scary introduction. Um, at first, let me also just say, Madam President, thank you again. You've really honored us uh, by being here. I hope you get a selfie before we leave. That's the most important part of my day. My mother will kill me if it doesn't happen. <laughs> you don't want that on your head. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just so pleased to be here. Uh, it's, it's been a long journey for our team, for Gordon, uh, for Patricia Groover, the co-author of the report uh, that we released uh, very recently, uh, Hila Rasul Ayub, our, our director, uh, who works on Power Reimagined, uh, looks at uh, climate change. Uh, all of our panelists here today, um, um, the entire team uh, has worked so hard uh, to get to this moment. Uh, and in fact, uh, the conversation about you know, global disruption is something that we've been having uh, for a long time, uh, but really started for, for me, for Anne-Marie, uh, during the pandemic, uh, when we were stuck uh, at home uh, with not much to do other than panic. <laughs> Uh, and, and this is the idea that we came up with, is that we need to have this conversation, that they have to be, the conversations that we're having about uh, global security today have to be much more inclusive. Uh, we have to ask very hard questions um, and, and challenge um, the kind of status quo, as, as Madam President uh, just did. <coughs> um, you know, the last decade uh, and in the last few days, let's just, let's just talk about the last few days, we have seen um, a, a major war, the beginnings of a major war unfold on our cell phones, on tablets, on laptops. Um, and it's the second time around in the last 18 months that we've seen massive conflict unfold uh, on digital devices. Uh, 12 years ago, we were talking about Web 2.0. And uh, we were worried about our kids uh, and family members getting sucked into Facebook. Now, uh, we're worried about the singularity and what will happen with artificial intelligence? How, how will it reshape uh, human communities and human society? Uh, and these are the questions that we've been grappling with uh, over the last little while through our Digital Futures Task Force um, and uh, a gathering of individuals, uh, which includes, of course, Alejandro and, and several others, um, who've been really asking hard questions about the way digital technology is changing our idea of sovereignty uh, in a world where we used to think about it as, you know, territory and boundaries and lines on maps, you can't do that in the virtual world. Um, and it's scrambling the way we think about norms and rights uh, and power, most importantly. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Alejandro Pisante is not only one of my favorites. Don't get jealous, guys. Um, <laughs> he's also one of the shining lights of our Digital Futures Task Force. Um, he is the Director General for Academic Computing Services of the National University of Mexico uh, in Mexico City. He served uh, the, uh, the community as a member of the ICANN board um, of directors. Uh, th those are the people that name domains um, and keep registry information. 
Um, he's educated in Mexico, and Alejandro does not play, let me tell you. Um, he knows a lot about science. He has degrees in chemistry, um, and, uh, physical chemistry. He spent time as a research scholar at uh, the prestigious Max Planck Institute for Research on, uh, on the solid state in Stuttgart, Germany. It's one of my favorite countries, and uh, Stuttgart's one of my favorite cities. Um, his career has been bound up with computing since 1972. We won't t ask your age. Uh, and with networks and, and the internet since the late 1980s. Uh, in other words, Alejandro knows what he is talking about. Um, the other person on this panel who knows what she's talking about is Nanjira Sambuli. Um, she is another kick butt <laughs> digital warrior, and her accomplishments are so outsized, I'm not really sure <laughs> I really should be sitting on this stage. Um, Nanjira is a Ford Global Fellow. She is also a board member of the New Humanitarian um, Development Gateway and Digital Impact Alliance. She also advises Carnegie Council's AI and Equality Initiative and the Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms. She's a member of the Gender Advisory Board at the UN Commission on Science and Technology for uh, Development. Uh, and as if that weren't enough, um, she also <laughs> um, really leads all the advocacy efforts on digital uh, equality uh, at the World Wide Web Foundation. Well, you used to, yeah. Well, you used to. <laughs> um, and she's worked at iHub, uh, Nairobi, uh, where she provided strategic guidance for growth on technology and innovation research in the East Africa region. Thank you for coming. My God, what a biography. Okay. Um, <laughs> our third panelist, uh, Rohinton Madura, is no less distinguished, and he soon will be my favorite. Um, <laughs> Rohinton is a distinguished fellow and former president of the Center for International Governance and Innovation, uh, CG, if you guys don't know it, you should. Um, Everyone apparently loves having Rohinton on the board because he is the chair of a lot of boards. Uh, he's a chair of the board on the Institute for New Economic Thinking, vice chair at the McLuhan Foundation, board member of uh, the Partnership for Economic Policy, and he is on the advisory boards of the WTO, cha WTO chairs uh, program, uh, UN Merit, uh, and Global Health Center. He is also a professor of practice uh, at McGill University's Institute for Study in International Development Rohinton also sits on a commission on uh, global economic transformation. He knows the most famous guy in the world on soft power, Joseph uh, Stieglitz, and many, many, many other things. Um, welcome, all three of you. Thank you for joining us. So um, we were t you know, touching on this sort of challenge that we have now with the way digital technologies, and particularly AI, are really transforming um, everything from conflict to sort of crisis management. Uh, and there are some good things too. Let's talk about, you know, MNRA. I mean, without, without artificial intelligence, we would not have had uh, a pandemic, um, I think, relief, uh, ultimately. But there's been a lot of inaction on regulating uh, digital technologies, which have let platform companies like Meta, um, you know, and others do a lot of damage um, in communities uh, that are particularly vulnerable. We can think of the crisis with the Rohingya genocide. We can think of uh, many different instances. Given that history and background, um, I'm going to turn to you, Alejandro, first, um, because you are my favorite. Um, <laughs> uh, no. um, really, where are we going to go next? I mean, we've got inaction, a history of inaction, but any chance of that shifting for AI? Do we see any kind of activism happening? Take a deep breath. Okay. <laughs> but no, first, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to oblige to thank Candace and uh, Gordon LaForge, Patricia Gruber, Riley Rogers for uh, all for the, this invitation. I take it uh, especially uh, as, as, as a big honor because you already know me. So that's uh, you already saw me in action in this same room for the for the task force, and that was a fantastic experience, which I thank you for. Uh, for. Uh, I'm also in awe of the convening power of, uh, of, of this organization for many years. I visited over here more than a decade ago. Uh, and I'm very glad to, to tell you there's someone in this room who really knows this stuff. That's uh, Dr. Steve Crocker, who's sitting down there. He's former chair of ICANN. He's, among many other merits, the person who invented the request for, for, uh, for comments procedure for standardizing the internet in the Internet Engineering Task Force. 
and uh, many, many other towering achievements and still very, very active in this field. And there's David Olive, from, who's the ICANN office, and Iria Puyosa, who comes from a DFR project. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, for me, a, uh, an additional sign of convening power, and I'm very honored to be sitting on the same uh, days that uh, Madam Johnson Sirleaf was. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of your work in Liberia since it was happening, and I mean, f from the news, and uh, in absolute awe. Of, uh, of, of those achievements and what you are now charged with that may shape the digital world as well in, in, in many ways. So I, I, now that I have that out of my chest, of my chest. Uh, so there is action and inaction. But there, it's not only inaction. Uh, what we have to realize, I think, I, I, I'll, I'll go straight to this. Uh, today's Panic will be tomorrow's platform. Um, a few centuries ago, Plato was scared and very disgusted that people were resorting to writing, and he thought that would damage the use of memory forever. And we have had the same type of concern when uh, radio was going to intrude into our kitchens with voices from outside the house whether it was going to be you know, good music and uh, constructive education or propaganda, no one knew at the time. And of course, both things happened. And it's all the way, you know, every new media. The thing is that maybe these disruptions were change, happening once every millennium, then once every half millennium, and now we have 20 of them a year. Uh, so we are always chasing the past. We're fighting the last war, so to speak. What I th think that's happening more importantly now is that we, are, we have to realize that the platforms, the panics, the changes, uh, Web 2.0, uh, artificial intelligence, what have you, are shedding light on what humans actually do to each other, mm. individually or through institutions or through organizations, organizations that may be, you know, virtues like the Wikipedia or evil like uh, terrorist groups or criminal gangs, the whole criminal ecosystem. The cyber criminal ecosystem is an exact map of the classic physical uh, ecosystem. It goes by segmentation, need to know basis, cells, hiding information, hiding identity. It's very amplified by the internet. As we have talked sometime, I see six factors to map these things from what we know on offline to what happens online. Uh, the first of them is, of course, the hyperscale of the internet, the speed with which things can happen. You know, the flare-ups can happen in a few hours. That would take a couple of years, 50 years ago. We have the question of identity, which the internet doesn't really give you any identity except your IP address, which is very difficult. And people can hide behind the internet for crime, or they can hide behind the internet for whistleblowing and for starting a rebellion against an oppressive regime. So these are two-sided two, two uh, knives. Then we have the, cross, the global reach of the internet, which means we are always crossing jurisdictional borders, which make, can maybe for the good to spread uh, sexual health education to young women in religious oppressive regimes, and there are many religions that are like that, at least locally, uh, or to organize crime. And we have a lowering of barriers to start things, to start organizations, companies, um, NGOs, or criminal gangs. We have a friction reduction, which means things happen very fast with a click of a button, and sometimes we have to manage against that speed so that you won't transfer your whole heritage to someone who tells you that he is uh, the, 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 the heir of uh, General Taylor from Liberia who holds you know, tons of gold. And uh, <laughs> you, for, for a modicum of $50,000, he'll transfer everything to you. Uh, and that, what, that was the, the, the first news people have about J Taylor uh, outside uh, the people who read the news. It's amazing. And the final one is a huge trove of memory. So now what we have for AI is we have to look at it in this same way. What is it doing? Uh, who is doing what? And then see how it's changed by the technology. Dissect and then reassemble. But then you know what remedies will have to be for people. Laws will not work about technology. Laws, the object of the law is behavior. It's people or collectivities or governments, but the law will not fix 
steel. It will fix using twisted steel to open locks outside your house. Mm. The behavior. Yeah. It's all, I mean, you know, policy that focuses on behavior is rare mm. <laughs> lately. Right. Um, but Nanjir, I know you have something to say about this, but let me yeah. add an additional kind of nuance uh, mm -hmm. to the question, which is, you know, we have seen a lot of big names in artificial intelligence come out, some people you know, um, but the conversation is pretty limited right now in terms of like who's at the table. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I agree. It's not that there's been an action so much as the kinds of action we need from power holders are insufficient in the sense that with technology, especially in the last two decades, the harms, whether it's from the era of Facebook and other social media, sort of the rate of diffusion of technology has become faster. The warning signs have almost always come from the developing world. So the adverse uses we started to see um, from Myanmar right off the bat in 2013 when you know, these platforms started to sort of proliferate across societies, those were ignored. Um, my favorite an example here is usually Cambridge Analytica and how it's spoken about here in the US, but before they, cut their, they got here, they cut their teeth in operations in Kenya, in Nigeria, in South Africa, and elsewhere. As those warnings were being sent out, they weren't being heard. So there's also a lot about where are the, you know, sites that are centered for crisis for these issues to be taken seriously. And it's the same thing we're seeing with artificial intelligence now. The language around safety, the language around the moratorium and other th calls for action center very specific viewpoints and not everybody's. So for one, there's an interesting s sense of creating fear. Um, and this fear is also obfuscating the need for governance. And in this sense, the need for state actors to set the rules of the road that these powerful players can then heed to. So they want to create the panic and then tell us, tell us that they're the ones who know how best to govern themselves. Y'all just don't worry, we've pa we've, you just stay panicked. We're gonna figure this thing out on the back end here and we'll come back to you with more technology uh, <laughs> rather than fixing the impulses that are driving whether it's AI being deployed prematurely uh, without the right requisite, you know, measures and continuing adverse practices like relying on underpaid labor to train the models that then we're all experimenting with. So it really, is, in a sense, is technologies have shown us, uh, to, to, to build on Alejandro's point, it's a, they've been a mirror, and we're not liking what we're seeing in the mirror, and we're running off panicking rather than looking deeply and staring deeply into what is being reflected for us to fix. So that remains a challenge, um, whether we're talking about those days of Facebook or now artificial general intelligence, as uh, our friends in San Francisco want us to frame the conversation. Our friends in San Francisco, so powerful, Rohinton. Um, what's your take? So, first, thank you for having me um, as your least favorite panel. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. I still love you. And 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 I'd make I guess two points on on sort of AI concentration and action and inaction. The first is that um, I, I like to think of AI as having uh, broadly three streams of impact. Uh, one is on the sort of nexus of issues around security, human rights, privacy, surveillance. The second is on uh, economy and jobs and, and what it does to labor markets. And then the third is the most of science fiction like singularity. What, what happens when AI outwits us all? And if you think of action and inaction, I'd say there's been some um, not enough, and I'll come to that in a second, action on that first sense. I mean, we all understand the, the security and so on dimensions, as you all pointed out. Um, but values are different. On the second stream, uh, jobs and so on, I think there's been almost no action. I mean, we talk about taxing robots so that governments can produce or fund public goods for the citizens, but we're not there. Um, and we're, there's nothing that I have seen that suggests that we're going to deal with that anytime soon. And then on singularity, I mean, there's no, I mean, we have evidence from biotech and, and other kinds of advanced sciences that there are ways for societies to grapple with nuclear technology. But we haven't really come anywhere near that. There's a debate about whether you can cut off computing power, but it's still at that stage. My second point, 
where there has been action, think of the range that we're seeing. Uh, the draft EU legislation on AI is risk-based. My, my country is Canada's, is too. Uh, China's is kind of based on technologies. And what these countries do is they talk about low-risk and high-risk AI. And in the EU legislation, for example, high-risk AI is something like social scoring or the use of facial recognition technology in public places is banned. It's just not good. In China, that is exactly what AI is used for in the public good. I mean, there's a genuine sense there that some of this, like going through airports or dealing with COVID, this technology has worked. And we are going to use facial recognition technology in public. How do you square those? Mm. So I guess I'm saying there has been action at the national and sometimes regional level, globally, and I, I know you'll come to that, making these different perspectives talk to each other in a way that we have a global chapeau, which I thought your report did quite well, given how impossible the situation is. Mm. We're some ways from it. So let me, I, I, I'm really a big fan of going off script, um, and my team knows this very well. Uh, but I want to unpack something that you just mentioned, Rohintin. It's something that we've been kind of debating and talking about a little bit, is the, the impacts of artificial intelligence on the workforce. Um, two things happened over the summer, right? We saw um, the uh, Screen Actors Guild and the Writers Guild go on strike um, because really, A, the technology of streaming Right on the internet, yet another technological, you know, kind of d defining moment, um, has totally reshaped the industry uh, beyond recognition. Uh, now people receive pennies. Sometimes, you know, they get like a check for twenty cents mm -hmm. uh, on their residuals. Right. This was the big uh, conundrum for the the Screen Actors Guild and also for the Writers Guild. Um, but there's also the additional piece of artificial intelligence. Right. Uh, you know, the use of uh, artificial intelligence for voiceover, for creating characters, right? Um, even writing scripts. Um, and a parallel here is um, the UAW uh, right now on strike. Uh, biggest, you know, uh, union, at least one of the most powerful in the country. And uh, what are they asking about? They're asking about two things. One, you are stripping down the machine that we've been building for you know, a couple centuries now uh, into parts that uh, essentially will take away jobs. We'll eliminate jobs from the, from the line. Um, but two, you're also using artificial intelligence. You're creating potentially barriers uh, for us to uh, get skilled up. And one of my big bugbears when I hear here in Washington uh, on the Hill, we, we can just you know, artificial intelligence is going to be fine. We can just reskill everybody. <laughs> it's going to be good. Let's talk a little bit about the workforce impact of AI, um, and not just in the United States. I really like globally. Um, what can we expect to see from that? And I'm going to go to Nanjira, yeah. uh, and then you, Rohinton, and, and Alejandro. I think it's it's going to be a mixed bag. Um, I'm, uh, if I may focus on how we're seeing it, at least with the conversations on the future of work or the present of work in Africa. Before we even talk about the artificial intelligence side of it, it is just workforce precarity exists, as it were. Younger and younger populations that are not easily absorbed into the economies as they are structured, what do you do with that workforce? Um, and then they're also the source of cheap labor to power the data labeling and the sort of the concept of data janitorialism has come up because they're being, this work is being outsourced to the Kenyas and other space in Morocco and elsewhere to train Chad GPT and other models on this is an image of a human and this is not. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, you can't even see yourself represented in the outcome. There's a story just this week about generative AI refusing to generate an image of a black, an African doctor with patients. It just could not. It could not consider an African doctor. It could only consider a doctor to be a white person. And then at some point, when probed further, it decided it preferred to show a giraffe with children <laughs> rather than an African doctor with children. Wow. So you've worked on this end to train these models, and then they're not even seeing you. They're not representative of you. Um, there's, there's that aspect of just the long chain of injustice there that could, is, is unfolding. Um, there is the question about 
creativity and where skilling comes in because a lot of what people are starting to, consensus is starting to generate is that on technical jobs, just everyday paper punching, pushing, there could be ways where artificial intelligence does better, quote unquote, but that's a question of where those people will be taken, those who have those jobs. So I think the fact that that's a conversation and a concern around the world means that for the first time in a long time, we'll have to go back to the books on what labor and worker rights have been, all these things we've written through ILO, International Labor Organization, and other spheres. What will that mean? And that will call for planetary uh, solidarity. Because the worker who's precariously suffering at UAW and the construction worker um, down on the, in the continent who's trying to get, you know, that to sustain them as a living, but you know, I don't know, development money brings you a robot to build your infrastructure there. there there's, a, there's something there that ties them. And that future, the fear that we don't know where people are going to have sustainable jobs, at least allows us not to see it as all oh, AI doomerism, but to start speaking about what will solidarity look like in saying whether it's reskilling of workers or whether it's ensuring that the pace at which these technologies are introduced does not upset systems. Mm -hmm makes us at least have room for a new conversation. I mean, Rohinton, does that scare you? Because it scares me. Because I, you know, when you think about the folks who are in charge of regulation, right, people that you've dealt with, uh, you continue to deal with, are they ready for what was just described here? Um, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, the, sort of the path to prosperity and development has been to move from agriculture to low-end manufacturers and then up that value chain. That's how Britain, Germany, and France did it. That's how the tigers in East Asia did it. Uh, and that's how the current, you know, that's how Vietnam sees its future in Burma. Now think about that. Suppose you're Kazakhstan, or Ethiopia, or Tunisia, where you haven't even reached that middle stage. And more and more of the tasks are being automated at the low end. Some of us think about 40% of them have. So that entry level and that middle level step that you need to become um, something else just isn't going to be available. It's already not been available. Now, we're not supposed to bring slides, and, and I, I'm not a PowerPoint fan, but there's, there's one I'd like to show, which is the photo of, I think it's Nike, that reopened its first plant in Europe some years ago after moving all these operations to Asia over the years. And it's the photo of the shop floor. And all it is is robots. I mean, uh -huh. so you can, you, know, you can reshore and all of that, but it's just not going to be like it used to be. Mm -hmm. So the employment absorption, and, and then the question becomes, as you were saying, well, are we going to revisit the labor leisure trade-off? Will jobs look different? Will we work less? All of the above in countries that have the social systems and the humanities to not just retrain people technically, mm. but to actually have people think about digital literacy and, and what it means to think in a different era. Mm. But there's a lot, large part of the world, one-fifth of the world, does not have meaningful or any privacy or data legislation. So the soft infrastructure you need to deal with all of this change just isn't there. Mm. And so uh, I think this worries me a lot. And I don't think it's enough to assume away the, I mean, I, I have great sympathy for the strike in Hollywood, but that's, that's just a microcosm of what others are going to face. And I don't think, as some of my economist colleagues do, one can assume this away by saying, all of this wealth be cre can be created. If we can simply redistribute it, we will all be doing other funkier things. <laughs> I think we have to have that conversation in a more granular way. And, and it will happen, but it's not happening quite yet. Other funkier things. Thoughts? Well, um, so I, I, I put the, uh, I mean, I, I agree we have a huge problem. And I think that uh, putting a few drops of skepticism on some of the grand statements can help us <laughs> reanalyze these things without denying the, the seriousness of the problem. Actually, it may, it may even underline how bad it is. So I'll use two very simple guidelines. One of them, uh, about 30 years ago, Peter Cowhey, who was a professor at uh, UCSD, and Jonathan Aronson in, I think, UCLA, uh, did a lot of very good work on the trends in technology and its governance. And one thing that they remarked, uh, and many others in, in technology actually know this by heart, it's what happens, <coughs> is 
there's a huge trend to miniaturization and modularization of stuff. And that's been a long, long term. And that's what Rohinton was already mentioning. You know, it's, uh, you know, first you replaced humans with machines, then machines became bigger. And then at some point, machines, uh, like, and, and I mean steel mills, uh, broke down and you had smaller steel mills substituting for them. And you could now place them in more, more countries and so forth. So that, that's a trend that uh, it's made by humans. Humans have decision power over it. But so far, it has worked more like tectonic plates. It's, uh, the, all the humans have, have been in the position to make a decision. They've made decisions that go in this trend. We didn't see in Hollywood uh, camera, a camera person's strike, a camera operators or photographers strike against Apple when they introduced a smartphone. <laughs> Yet it was, and it may have taken a lot of camera jobs away, but it also produced a huge world of short films, of films made with a single camera on a, on a small tripod, remotely controlled from, uh, from, from, from a laptop or uh, with, with another similar camera. Uh, these are trends that uh, suddenly are hitting, uh, and this, I will say this tongue in cheek because we are that, uh, hitting the manifesto writing class. So our manifestos are now going to be written by artificial intelligence. <laughs> and they are going to be read by an artificial intelligence. My favorite take on the, this whole LLM revolution, ChatGPT, is guys in, in one room saying, I have a script that I tell them one word and it writes a beautiful uh, email, and the guys in the other room are saying, I have a script that gets this huge worthy email and tells me in one word what it means. <laughs> and that's, you know, again, it's illuminating, it's throwing light on how we are doing, how we're working. Writing blurbs for, uh, for ads is a huge waste of intelligence in the sense that you can have 99% of the words in the blurb written by a machine. So what's the genius there? Maybe just distilling it into one picture now. Um, so uh, the other guideline for me, and it comes together, is the cost of not doing. And this goes especially for country, developing countries, developing economies. Uh, we have legislators feverishly writing laws against or for regulating uh, artificial intelligence. In, in the Mexican legislature alone, there are already 16, 13 initiatives for cybersecurity, and this semester we are seeing already 15 or so for artificial intelligence. Why aren't these legislators, why weren't, where were these legislators when they could have allotted 5% instead of 0.1% of the national budget for education and research? Mm. We are paying the cost of not having done the job that we should have done, or that our people in government should have done 20 or 50 years ago to level the playing field. We have very smart people from every developing country doing fantastic work in artificial intelligence, in Google, in Meta, or in Alibaba. Yeah. Not in country. Mm -hmm. So that's actually, so you bring me to the next question, which is on script, uh, but related to this, of course. You know, we've, um, Ian Bremer wrote this fantastic piece in Foreign Affairs, I guess it was last year, um, talking about sort of our techno-polar moment. moment. Uh, and I think we can all sort of acknowledge that, you know, Meta and Alibaba, uh, you know, Alphabet, these, these are not countries, these are not corporations, um, these are becoming empires uh, and that own um, whole parts of the virtual world, but also whole parts of the earth. Um, and with that high over concentration of power, uh, we see challenges with data access, um, control, um, you know, bringing value from your own data. In Nigeria, you were just sort of referring to that. Um, we've talked a little bit in, in our Digital Futures Task Force about how to break through the challenge of the Global South in particular. Um, gaining more control over data access, um, for fending against internet shutdowns. Uh, any answers? One, any answers in the form of an institutional um, or coalition building um, response 
beyond just sort of like, oh, I think it would be better if it was good. <laughs> what can we do um, institutionally um, or in some sort of coalition format to sort of respond to uh, this inequality of data access and data control? I'll let anybody jump in. <laughs> On the inequality of data access and control, there's two ways I like to think of it. There's this moment now where these models are learning faster what they can learn based on a very limited archive of which they're being trained. So there's a quest to get more data, so diversify the data sets. So the rush to get more languages, more contexts, more realities that haven't been included is happening. But in so doing, it's a very extractive model that's starting to emerge that isn't so much trying to work within the context and actually register those dividends as distributed equally then. It's almost like let's extract them, you know, get them to this center, and then maybe some trickle down aspects will happen. So for example, with trying to get more languages to train chat GPT and others, you know, endangered languages are an interesting one because you can have these tools help redistribute them in the archive or maintain an archive of them to be learned. But there are communities now pushing back and saying those benefits first have to come to us before they go out there, chat GPT, open AI, somebody makes all the profits. A new script <laughs> on a storyline um, that's a lived reality um, and, and bring it back. So there are these interesting conversations about how do you go from the least connected to the overly connected, what's the through pass there in distributing um, equitable gains from these technologies rather than waiting for this increasingly unaccountable force that is the private companies that are running this across the board to maybe redistribute back through philanthropy or through uh, social enterprises or corporate social responsibility. And even where governments are not the ones stepping in, which is the, the case in most places, that people power, this questioning power is a really interesting impulse that for me is less about, the big question has been do we start reforming institutions that are or build new ones. And in between that, before that happens, is where will people be represented either way? Because we tend to ossify things through institutions, right? Um, but there's the dynamism of who's needing to be represented there that may not be represented in these institutions, whether we start afresh or whether we reform quickly. So there's the thinking of how to govern in agile ways that needs to pair up with the conversation about what are these institutions that are representative planks for us to have global tables, so to speak. Um, but the world isn't waiting for that, you know? People are actually seeking you know, justice and equity now, not in the lifetimes to come. In Africa, we used to be told we, the young people are the future. I've, I'm done being young, I'm still not the future, right? <laughs> so the next generation is watching that. There's an urgency, I like to say, there's too many people living in the age where the cans that were kicked down the road are right here. So they're not waiting for us to have the neat conversation that is ordered about UN reform. It's about right now, we are speaking, we are saying this is how we're organizing, this is how we are trying to find ourselves represented. How can they be supported is just as important a conversation than, as the reform one of these institutions. So, I mean, here's the irony. You, you mentioned data inequities and so on, but way more people live in developing countries than in developed countries. Data is set to be the new oil. It's the raw material. And people think of it as a fifth factor of production now. It's a raw material for all of these things, AI and, and digitization that you're talking about. So if the assets and the raw materials are where they are, there's ways to conceive of that institutional response. I think if companies are using data that's generated in the global south, then a small step forward, a very small, but at least it's a step forward, is the tax treaty that we've seen, the G20 and OECD broker, in which um, big digital platforms have to pay a minimum tax and cannot finagle, legally finagle their accounts to pay taxes in low tax jurisdictions. That's a good start. Um, at CG, where, where, uh, which I used to lead, as you mentioned, uh, we, we did a lot of work on what are called data trusts, okay? Just as you put your savings dollars in mutual fund X and not Y because you like its portfolio and its rate of return, think about all the data that we generate and that belongs to us as individuals. 
You could think of data trusts as being national or sectoral, as Nanjira and I, who sat on a Lancet Commission on Global Health, um, proposed. But there are ways to deposit data for uses that you want. And then the monetized or non-pecuniary benefits from data trusts go to the shareholders, the people who contributed their data. So there's ways of thinking of this. And the final point I'd make is, you know, just as after the financial crisis in 2007 and 8, we recognized that the troika of the World Bank, IMF, and WTO was not up to the task of dealing with financial sector instability. That was just not something that could have been conceived of in 1944. We created the Financial Stability Board, which is a multi-stakeholder group that hasn't made financial systems perfect, but it's many steps in the right direction. And again, at CG, we've proposed something called the Digital Stability Board as an overarching multi-stakeholder. I mean, that's one thing we have to get away from national governments only. Inclusivity cannot just mean having more and more small countries. We have to think about science ethicists, consumer groups, um, industry indeed, coming together in an institution where best practice is exchanged, where there is adjudication of disputes, and some of these inequity issues can actually be dealt with through that as well. So, you know, we're far from it, and as Nanjira said, it may not happen as fast as some of us would like while we're still young, <laughs> but um, that's where the future lies. Alejandro, I see you writing a novel over here. What's happening? I'm taking careful notes because I, they, they, they give me anchors for what, you know, to build upon what uh, has been said. Um, it's, it's almost a, 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 you know, what you have just said is the paragraph I would like to have quoted before what I'm going to say now. So it's fantastic. Feel free. Uh, uh, so quoting the, the, the previous speakers, uh, we have, uh, first, I've heard uh, in many fora, uh, among others, the Global Partnership for AI and uh, an initiative by, uh, led by uh, Dr. Paul Toomey, which is called the GID, which is a, a very interesting initiative to look at legislative and other solutions for data control, for individuals regaining data control. Uh, the, the idea of data commons or data trusts has come up. I still have a lot of questions about how they could actually be built mm -hmm. and governed. They would have to form a sort of labor union of, uh, or consumer union. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have all the questions about how to build that representation, keep it away from capture, from corporate or governmental cop uh, capture and so forth. But that's an idea that's floating around. At any rate, I think that we have uh, good precedent to look at in the almost 30 years that internet governance has been a field or a thing. Uh, what we have been able to build in the internet governance field is organizations, institutions, and mechanisms, because governance is not always you know, about written rules, uh, that manage these shared resources. Uh, ICANN is uh, one example that's one of the most formalized. It has a dispute resolution uh, procedure that's uh, very detailed and uh, it has a lot of chances for redress of uh, wrongs and so forth. It's fully multi-stakeholder. It really brings together governments. Actually, one of the curious things that uh, bothers some people in, in, in ICANN is that the governments sit in an advisory role. They have an advisory, a government advisory committee. It has special powers. It can stop things almost totally cold on the tracks, but it's uh, an advisory committee. Uh, just as, a, as an anecdote to tell you how this came to happen, at the uh, reform that we made in ICANN in 2003, we offered the government representatives to study a change in the structure where the government advisory committee would actually sit five directors by election uh, in, in the board of directors of the corporation, or three. Uh, it took them about 30 minutes to reject the offer <laughs> because they said first, uh, we would become liable for any uh, litigation that this organization goes into. And we as rep government representatives cannot be part of a litigation in a private, uh, even if non-profit organization. And the second one was some of them said in very low voice, there's no way we could agree, get 240 governments to agree on five representatives, even if it were regional. So this has been a very healthy structure 
And what we see is other multi-stakeholder organizations working in the internet governance field. Uh, ICANN is very formalized, it has a large budget, it has formal meetings three times a year in different countries, uh, and it has, as I said, all these teeth for uh, things that go wrong with uh, the central part of the domain name system. Everything else is decentralized. You have something called the Anti-Phishing Working Group, which is a very lightweight organization. It's mostly meetings and communications led by a guy called Peter Cassidy, who's a former FBI accountant kind of person. Uh, the, it brings together police forces, uh, law enforcement. Uh, it brings together the banks where the assets are. That, and, and now, of course, there are many other non-financial assets, like you know your Netflix account. So everybody that sort of puts together or has to hold a fence against phishing. Uh, and the platforms where phishing occurs, which is like the large email providers, large messaging providers, that's where the exchanges take place, which actually pull out people's resources. It's a very light organization, and it's done a lot of work that we don't see. You, the way we see that we don't see it is the huge decrease in phishing attempts you can get through email for example, and the way you can make them decrease now in other messaging platforms. Uh, you can see that kind of, of stuff working in, in many ways, and I would not advise to just copy any of these organizations, but to learn the lessons from multi-stakeholder uh, uh, organizations or mechanisms in the internet field, and of course look at the many others, like the Financial Stability Board, there's a lot of multi-stakeholder, even if it's not called so explicitly, in sports governance, in finance governance, sometimes inside countries, sometimes globally. And that would be a good field to bring in the, the learning into this other question. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, but on where we are thinking about new global planetary uh, institutions, whether they borrow from the multi-stakeholder model, multilateral model, otherwise, one big thing that is emerging that is clear is it's something that has to get especially the big powers on the same table. So you need the US and China as super producers on the same table. What's happening all too often is there are new formations that are emerging that will almost always sideline one or the other. So you're finding maybe the Chinese group is organizing different stakeholders. The US group is organizing others. There's an interesting divide around digital authoritarianism, digital democracies, which are terminologies that don't fit neatly anyway. That is not going to help us with where we need to be headed because at the end of the day, both powers in the quest to participate in geopolitical competition, including in technology, are rushing for that data. So if they come to a source that says the continent and um, we have a saying, you know, when two bulls fight, it is the grass that suffers. Right. Uh, when your data is still being extracted because they're contending, uh, you know, real, uh, you know, powers, and you're trying to get the resources to develop from either side without, you know, getting caught up, you I think a policymaker is going to spend a lot more time fighting these, you know, <laughs> little uh, tensions rather than actually pulling resources to work for them. Mm -hmm. So that's a reality we must not lose sight of, and especially here in DC, that whatever would be proposed as international absolutely has to get the other powers that are creating these technologies in the same room to find some rules of the road. Yeah, I'm so glad you raised this. I mean, at the risk of offending uh, most of Washington, D.C., and most of the White House just down the street over here, I will say I am extremely pleased to see the fading away uh, of uh, that initiative uh, whereby, um, you know, there was this sort of we are the authoritarian versus the, yeah. the great democracies because obviously we know uh, we're all in trouble, right? I mean, democracy is in trouble everywhere. Um, authoritarianism is everywhere. Um, and it doesn't neatly sort of um, you know, sit with inside uh, any particular set of borders, as it turns out. Yeah. Um, we're all struggling with these challenges, um, and they're, they're difficult, I think, to, to grapple with if we do have this kind of very binary approach. Um, I think we are at a point where um, questions from the audience would be very welcome, and I want to invite you to come up here and uh, make yourself known. Lots of um, good questions to, I'm sure, ask. Um, while I do, while I wait for somebody to step up to the mic, I'm going to just take the prerogative and ask a very quick question. We um, touched on uh, data sovereignty uh, in our conversations uh, in May, and um, I think that Mr. Drucker is going to address some of this. Um, I just want to touch on a little bit on the data sovereignty question. Uh, we've seen China 
uh, make bids in the ITU, Russia make bids in the ITU. Um, I'll let you answer it and then we'll get to these questions. Right. Data sovereignty, do, what kind of stakeholder format would we need to really address many of the questions um, that are coming up there? Yeah, I mean, I think there are more questions we have to ask on what we mean by data sovereignty um, and whether we are resorting back to sort of jurisdictional sovereignty where your national government through data protection or privacy laws necessitates that certain data does not migrate from, uh, you know, so civil data, for example, is not transferred either through servers or extracted by companies. Is that the form of data sovereignty we're speaking of? Is it individual sovereignty? And how does that fit in a world where uh, rights are not just about individuals, but about communities, which is essentially what the African, you know, human and uh, people's rights charter talks about. It tries to balance the fact that you're an individual within a community, and that's a kind of corpus we haven't tapped into in finding other solutions. Too much of the focus on individual rights, the way the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has shown us, has limited us from thinking about other, other ways to do it. So a lot of focus from Europe and elsewhere is around protecting an individual, an individual protecting their data. But am I going to protect it from China, the US, my government, you know, the companies? How much is one individual capable of doing? And are we, sh are we selling ourselves short by still having a legal precedent that is being set through that model when we're talking about co a concept as tenuous as data sovereignty? Some might argue we don't even have the sovereignty of that data anyway. It's crossing all over the internet and the cables and all that jazz. Um, but I think it's a term that's being thrown around a lot without really contextualizing what that means without also creating what would be a protectionist uh, d dimension. And I think uh, in others are also calling for cross-border data flows with trust, which just says there could be a version of it that doesn't have trust, um, which tells a lot about the fact that we just need to sit more with that question and hear perspectives from different regions on what people are thinking and collectives. So I think there's work there to be done, more work to be done. Always with this quick answer, I like it. All right, um, questions from the audience, sir. Steve Crocker. Um, I'm going to make an old guy's comment uh, that'll make uh, Alejandro look like a youngster. Fifty years ago, and a little bit more, I had a job at uh, DARPA writing the checks to support the artificial intelligence research program. Um, and, so, and, and the challenge at the time, as a youngster then, was how do I write the justification for the work we're doing? Because typically DARPA programs in those days were five-year programs, and I knew for sure that we were in for a 50-year uh, process of trying to build AI. So I look at the current controversies about AI today, and I say, yeah, this is great. We got there finally. But <laughs> as you commented, we're going to go a little bit further. We may go a whole lot further. And so a lot of the commotion of the moment is really of the moment. And you haven't seen anything yet in a way. Mm -hmm. um, a particular data point uh, or prospective data point, I was talking to Raj Reddy last year about the uh, progress in speech understanding. So this relates to both in a positive and negative way about uh, preservation of languages and so forth, and asked uh, what his prediction was about the ability to have real-time translation uh, in language so that we could each speak in our own native languages and be understood in equality. He said he had put himself on record a year earlier, so it was two years ago, that in 10 years, eight years from now, 100 languages, facile, real-time translation. Maybe it'll happen in eight years, maybe it'll take a little longer, but, but and, and it was an informed, I can tell you, if you don't know who Raj Reddy is, a very, very well-informed uh, opinion. Um, uh, let me set that aside and, and bring in a different aspect. Um, a lot of attention to the displacement of uh, jobs and um, uh, increase in inequity in wealth and uh, control. I'm not an economist, so I'm going to make amateur comments here. Wealth is roughly, in, in my uh, limited perspective, divided up into what are your skill sets in terms of individual labor, what assets do you control, and <coughs> related but slightly different, what f facilities, organizations, and so forth, what your power structure is. And we're seeing shifts in all of this. Uh, but if you stand back and look at it, I say, well, what's the wealth of a nation? And one can imagine, 
now moving into sort of semi-science fiction territory, that if instead of valuing what a person can do to create uh, income for himself or herself, what a, a, co a country or a people can do to create um, the means of support and uh, uh, prevention of uh, disease and all sorts of things as a community, then <coughs> you have different ways of approaching how you distribute the, the benefits of that wealth, and that leads to political uh, uh, issues of um, do you have uh, capitalism or do you have socialism, etc. And I don't want to take a position on which of those needs to be the best. I suspect that there's no perfect answer, and any extreme is 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 wrong. So, but my putting that together with my uh, other point is that things are changing, and. And, and here's the devilish problem. Things are changing at different rates. Mm -hmm. The Westphalian uh, uh, order of things preserved and created a lot of order in the world, in a, in a sense, um, and also hardened the interactions so that it, it made nation states the primary way of organizing things around the, the globe. Now we're in a state where, uh, a situation where problems are besetting the planet that aren't simply every, every country should do for itself what's best. There's common things, and our institutions aren't naturally set up to create the kind of uh, uh, cooperation and uh, common action that's needed. And meanwhile, we have in the technology, we have very rapid changes in computing and AI now and so forth. Uh, things are changing at very different rates here. And so that, to me, is the big challenge, and we can have local focused solutions on how do we can apply AI, how we could regulate AI for facial recognition or surveillance and so forth. Not unimportant, but from a slightly broader perspective, almost a passing challenge that will be overtaken by the things. Pardon for the long. It's okay. And there's a question in there somewhere. Okay, I'm sure there's a question in there. Um, and I know that there's a question behind you. Uh, and we've got about three minutes. So what we're going to do is take the, the two questions um, and we're going to make you do um, kind of like quiz show style. You get 30 seconds to answer them. Go. All right, so we have a question from the online audience. Uh, what do the panelists think of the problem of junk data, the idea that AI will flood the internet with generated low value content, which makes it harder to find useful and original information? Is there a future where only the relatively rich can afford quality data? Ooh, oh, that's a good question. Junk data, OK. Hello, uh, Musa Siddiqui from United Nations University. and. So AI is a tool, and it's up to us to decide how to wield it. So it leads to benefits, but it also leads to consequences that need to be mitigated. So two questions on that. Firstly, when it comes to the development of AI, how can we develop effective public-private partnerships to ensure that the development is in alignment with the values of the international system, for instance, respecting human rights? And the second question, which is something that you actually mentioned, Nigeria, which was talking about the need for agile governance and the question of do we stick to existing institutions or create new institutions? So any ideas on how we can make these institutions more agile, given that you know they're 20th century institutions dealing with 21st century Entry challenges. Thank you. Great question. I'm going to summarize um, as best I can uh, so we can get 30 seconds out of you each. So I think what I heard was one uh, from Mr. Drucker, things are moving fast. Um, we're not skating to the puck, basically. How do we skate to the puck? That's number one. Number two, is it only the rich people out here who are going to be able to open their email uh, and feel OK about it? Um, or is it, is it going to be all the rest of us? Um, you know, are we going to keep getting you know, uh, junk data, junk uh, email, junk, junk, junk? Yeah. Um, what's the solution there? Uh, and last but not least, uh, I'm just going to go to the agility part because actually I think that's undervalued and uh, not talked about enough. Um, how do we make our response and our institutions more agile uh, when it comes to looking at the artificial intelligence challenge? You have exactly 30 seconds, go. <laughs> oh, I think that uh, I, I just, just one part of this, which is the question about whether old or new institutions. Uh, I think that it will be solved, it will be answered by first answering what problems, plural, uh, we can try to solve. Uh, we may be leaving some problems unsolved in, in the world, that's the history of humankind, but define a problem that brings 
together a group of stakeholders. You asked about private, public-private partnerships. That's exactly what multi-stakeholder means. Uh, find the problem, find who are the interested parties, and if there are harmed parties, find a way to bring the harming parties to, to the table. Uh, just a thir uh, five seconds. Thanks to the interpreters, the sign language interpreters. We've made your afternoon uh, very physical. Indeed. <laughs> they are fierce. Yeah, I think the junk data point it broader speaks to divides. And I think we're first approaching a new kind of divide where there'll be those of us majority who are connected and those who are disconnected are either those who are never connected or those who can pay their way out. So because the a vast majority of us are being shepherded into this space where even opening an app that previously used to give you information, you have to sift through all that, the junk that was rightfully mentioned to find one gem of insight. But there are people who are able to afford to pay their way out of these systems. For some, it's important to remember that there's also a form of coercion to use these tools uh, where we really rely on them. A reliance has been generated and then um, Cory Doctor calls it entitification of these apps where you first, it, it gives you a service, it's a valuable service and then it flips it on you and then keeps you locked in and you don't know how to find your way out easily. So there are these divides and they're going to keep shifting. Uh, we have to keep an eye out for that um, and figure out some rules before it's too late for everybody. Not to name names, but I feel that way about Gmail. Go. <laughs> I think DARPA and your space program are shining examples of how public investments re generate both public and private wealth. And so if we think about technology as being created not by free markets, but by public action, then the intellectual property that's created by technology should be seen more of a pub as more of a public good than we currently do. Our currents of IP regimes and trips and so on take us in the wrong direction. And so many of the points you made lead me to think that taxing the profits of um, the rents that accrue from technology so that governments can provide their citizens the things that they're meant to provide is the future of public policy. Mm -hmm. And on the middle point, um, you know, think of a continuum from data to information to knowledge to wisdom. And um, I don't think there's any algorithm yet that gets us as cleanly to that as the human brain. Mm -hmm. But where the money will be and where the action will be is to sift through the noise and the data and information to knowledge and wisdom. And that's what we should be, again, directing public action at. Hmm. Rohinton, you are now my favorite. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> oh, um, and I'm glad. Award of <laughs> You're all one my favorite. award of favorite. Uh, let's oh. give the, audit, the, the panelists uh, a hand here. Um, I thought it was an excellent discussion. <laughs> Thank you.